Good morning, esteemed colleagues, and thank you for joining us for another enriching session of the Caribbean Community of Practice for Climate Resiliency. Today, we're honored to have with us distinguished guest speakers from various island nations. They will share their unique perspectives and innovative solutions in climate resiliency, offering invaluable lessons for all of us. Following their presentation, we'll engage in an interactive question and answer session delving into the pressing challenges the Caribbean faces and exploring solutions being implement, implemented across the region. The International Road Federation, as many of you know, was founded in 1948 and was established with a critical mission to fa facilitate the exchange of best practices and seamless adoption of technological innovations. 76 years later, our commitment to this mission is unwavering. This roundtable series stands as a cornerstone of our effort to spread knowledge, share experiences, and introduce technologies aimed at creating safer and more resilient roads and transportation infrastructures. I'd also like to extend the heartfelt invitation to all participants of this webinar to join us at the 12th IRF Caribbean Regional Congress scheduled from July 30th to August 2nd, 2024 in San Juan, Puerto Rico. This event promises to be a prof profound opportunity to discuss and learn about the development of safe, resilient, and inclusive roads and mobility systems, along with the technologies and practices that support our collective goals. Before we dive into today's engaging content, a special note to our first time attendees, your microphones will be muted throughout the presentations to ensure clarity for all listeners. However, we greatly encourage your participation Please share your questions and insights by typing into the question section of the control panel, which you'll find on the right side of your screen. Alternatively, you can raise your hand and we'll, in, we'll, we'll be able to unmute your microphone during the Q&A session if possible in the second half of the webinar. Please note that all IRF webinars are recorded. Each participant will receive a PDF of the presentations and a full video recording of the session. Furthermore, IRF members enjoy free access to our extensive webinar library while non-members may access it with a single or multi-user license. For those not benefiting, benefiting yet from IRF membership, I encourage you to contact me after the webinar to explore the advantages. Now allow me to introduce myself. I'm Majid, serving as the Executive Vice President at the International Road Federation. It's my pleasure to welcome today's moderator and esteemed IRF member, Alex Campbell, Director of Engineering Solutions at, at Anyway Solutions. Alex and his team specialize in climate resilient engineering solutions for transportation infrastructure, focusing on developing countries where road systems are particularly susceptible to climate impacts. Alex, thank you for joining us and welcome. Thank you very much, Majid, and uh, welcome all participants uh, to our second session of the Caribbean Roundtable. Uh, it's a, a privilege again to have initiated this uh, with the um, with IRF, it's an, an important roundtable, and I hope that it grows into something more substantial uh, as we move from session to session. Uh, we have the um, just a few things I'd just like to remind uh, that some of the goals of today and the sessions of today are um, for each speaker to address some of the issues that they are experiencing within either projects that they are um, involved with in the Caribbean or their own country. Uh, some of the issues, the solutions, the approaches that they've taken. Uh, and the intent is that this is a, a, a learning um, a, a learning round table where we can share ideas and come together as a collective and understand that there are similar issues with similar solutions and that we can uh, work together and grow capacity within the region. Uh, we have three great speakers today. Uh, I have the privilege of inviting Kishan uh, Remkusun, who will be up first. Uh, Kishan is Associate Director of Beston, and he is in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting Kishan at a IRF climate resiliency course that uh, both Gordon Keller and myself were providing. Uh, several months ago in Orlando, and Kishan was an active participant and a dynamic and, and young individual within the Caribbean community. We have two other speakers as well. We're lucky to have Shanella Johnson, um, who is from Guyana, and she is the manager of engineering design with the Ministry of Public Works. 
And we also have one of my mentors. We have Gordon Keller, and Gordon uh, is a retired U.S. forestry geotechnical engineer and now a private consultant within the climate resiliency, low volume road and geotechnical engineering space. Uh, so with that, I'm very excited about the three uh, discussions we have today. I welcome you to post any questions you may have within the chat box, um, and we hope to answer as many of those as we can. So without further ado, I would like to invite Kishan. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here and thanks to the IRS for having me. I just want to make sure that you all can hear me and see my screen. Yes, we can yes, hear we... you and see your screen. Great, thanks. All right. So, as I mentioned, my name is Kishan Rampisun. I'm a civil engineer basically at the at Bestland Consultant. We're based in Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, sorry, not that one. We're based in Trinidad and Tobago, but we have offices throughout the Caribbean. Um, so, we focus on civil civil infrastructure and buildings. Um, but so we're going to talk about the climate resiliency of our civil infrastructure today. Um, the content of my presentation, we're going to talk about challenges. We're going to talk about the identification of gaps um, within the climate resiliency framework, the solutions that we are looking at and have implemented, and what opportunities for growth that we have as a Caribbean community. So, Firstly, I must talk about um, resilience and resilience. I mean, this is the second presentation that or wrong table has been discussed about this, but just to recap for those who are new, it's the ability to anticipate, prepare for, adapt to, adapt and withstand resp and respond to recover from disruptions. Um, that's an FHWA order. Um, important thing to remember about this uh, is three stages basically you have to prepare for, you have to withstand and recover. So normally when we think about resilience, we're thinking about the hard infrastructure and designing for certain events, but it's also the ability to withstand and recover and respond to. So in terms of vulnerability, that is what an asset or system is faced with and how can it um, withstand the effects. So this book on the right hand side is Vulnerability Assessment and Adaption Framework, pretty useful guide for determining um, your resiliency measures and your vulnerability of your assets. So what are some of the risks that we face? Sorry, wrong slide. Uh, so what are some of the risks that we face in the Caribbean? So we all know that we Caribbean people, we are basically in the, in the limelight for natural disasters. So we have flooding, we have earthquakes, we have um, hurricanes, among other many different natural forces. So when we're looking at risk, that is the potential of something happening against our infrastructure. And it's often represented by a probability of, or the likelihood of occurrence. So in terms of risk, in terms of flooding and landslides, where the, most of Caribbean islands and Guyana, in fact, is exposed to um, flooding, whether it be coastal or riverine flooding, major effects. So this, the picture on the left hand side is a picture of the Manson and Road in Trinidad. Um, it's a coastal road and affected by coastal flooding and riverine flooding as well, completely destroyed the road in 2023. And then on the right hand side, you've seen a picture of the Molonea landscape in Grenada, um, which is caused by many different factors, but usually um, in terms of land size development, you're looking at land use planning, the natural conditions of the soil and maintenance and drainage factors. Also gonna talk about a bit of resilience for pavements and actually road pavement and the effect of temperatures and heavier traffic loads on that. All right, some of the translation challenges again. Um, so in terms of resiliency and our resilience need, we must protect ourselves from the natural hazards and also have the capacity to recover. So when talking about resiliency, it's important to have different aspects, um, different aspects of the resiliency framework in place. So the picture on the left hand slide, well, both pictures are of land slips on the North Coast Road of Trinidad. The picture on the left hand side is pretty um, interesting because you have multiple facets of resiliency in this picture, pretty good and bad. So the good is that when the landslide happened, well, not, not that the landslide was good, but when the landslide happened, we had a stock, we turned out had a stock of daily bridges readily available to deploy for, to restore connectivity. 
and also when in terms of response to the to the hazard this BLE bridge was put up in a matter of days to restore the connectivity because this was a critical road feature in terms of the preparedness and the resiliency of the actual road um, when you look at maintenance one of the reasons that this landslide occurred besides the natural um, geological reasons or factors um, maintenance was a major issue because drainage in this area was not adequately maintained and that when drains were blocked after a heavy rainfall event um, it caused runoff to flow on the downhill side of the slope and that caught and that triggered the landslide um, and also in terms of resiliency our ability to respond to and also learn lessons from different um, scenarios is important we must have this training and must have this capability of understanding to be able to know what was done previously and take lessons learned from those and develop better solutions going forward or maintenance mm -hmm. procedures as well. So the picture on the right hand side um, is about two to three hundred meters away from the landscape on the left hand side. And this was this was about a year after um, the original landslide on the left. So I mean where was the lessons learned in that, right? Um, we should have been able we should have known that the road was at risk of failure for different reasons and we should have um, had measures in place to, pre to prevent that. All right, so in terms of identifying gaps, in the Caribbean, we suffer from a lack of hydrometeorological data in terms of all rainfall records on our river levels. Now, these are important for flood studies to determine what are the effects of rainfall events or storm events on a certain area in terms of the flood analysis or the floodplain mapping of, an area, of a particular area. So with rainfall records, we need to have accurate, hopefully hourly um, records so that we could be able to model or build models of, build hydrological models and then correlate that to river levels to know our flood levels. So that if, for example, if a storm is approaching and we expect 100 millimeters of rainfall, we can then put that into our model and with it being calibrated and validated by river levels, we can then know this is the extent of flooding. So this was a picture of um, St. John's River that we did a flood study on. Um, we had to use very sparse data for this, but we were able to verify this with um, survey data on the ground. Um, next one to talk about identify gaps, the inventories. We need to have an understanding of what we have in the Caribbean, especially government agencies, what we have in the Caribbean in terms of infrastructure and to know the historical context behind it, whether it's new structures, old structures, whether it's been upgraded, and whether it's vulnerable to certain um, natural disasters or climate, climatic effects um, is very important because you need to understand what we have so that when a certain storm event happens or disaster happens, you know which ones are prone to, or before, you need to know which ones are prone to being um, damaged on which ones need to be repaired soon after. So this was an example of a culvert inventory that we did um, for the Western Road corridor in Grenada. Uh, we mapped the whole, um, well, we documented and we did an assessment and capacity analysis of 230 culverts along the Western Road in Grenada. Um, the human resources capability. So the Caribbean people, we're generally very knowledgeable. We know what we need to do. Uh, the ones who are in high positions, government consultancy. So we have a great expertise in all fields. However, we have a lack, I would say, lack of staffing in most government agencies to actually do the work properly. And that's, um, that's a major hindrance to our ability to respond and also to prepare and to respond to natural disasters. Even our maintenance crews are very, um, I would say very short in terms of staffing to respond to disasters. The funding and the preparation, we normally like to fund projects after a major event has happened. So after something has failed, we then allocate money to fix the problem. We don't spend money, or we generally don't like to spend money um, before an event, um, for whatever reason, whether that's governmental, whether it's not uh, fashionable enough to spend money on preparedness. Um, that, that's a major problem in the Caribbean. Um, the studies done in states show that when you prepare for natural events or natural disasters, you save a lot of money. So this um, side, so this snippet from the National Institute of Building Sciences show that 
um, you get a six to one benefit to cost ratio when government agencies spend money on preparedness as compared to the response of natural disasters. So what are some solutions we have? So most people would understand um, the different stages or the philosophies of preparedness for, for resiliency. We're looking at, uh, first, first of all, there's protection, which is the completely strengthening our infrastructure to withstand any event. So generally you do this for buildings and important structures, important civil structures like bridges and so, um, generally for roads and drainage, you don't completely strengthen a, an event or a, or a facility, um, unless it's a very critical facility. So this example here was some culverts on the, one of the major highways in Trinidad where we had to reinforce the HV pipes or surround the HV pipes with concrete just to ensure that there would be no um, fire damage to it. In terms of adoption through modification, this is where we strengthen the infrastructure to give a higher probability of strengthening the disruption. So again, this is a bridge in Trinidad where we can see in the background a little snippet of a Bailey Bridge there. So every time it flood, Bailey Bridge would be submerged and there would be a lot of um, disruption to the community. Um, we replaced it with what well, we put in a new bridge, um, a triple cell box culvert to uh, reinforce concrete structure so that it could withstand any forces from any flood events and also it's higher than the existing bridge. So we did analysis of this bridge could withstand a 150 year return period and for 100 year events, um, it is safe. In terms of accepting and planning, there's some scenarios where we cannot um, avoid the damage, right? This is where we have to accept that there will be complete failure and a concrete risk and you need to have funds to address the problems or, or you need to have a proper response plan in place. So for St. John's River, um, we were able to model and provide um, protection measures for the one in 25 year return period storm. However, for storms greater than that or greater return periods, so let's say the 150, 100, we know that the river will be overtopped or the bank embankments will be overtopped and there will be certain measures that have to be kicked in when that, when that occurs. In terms of abandonment, there are some facilities that you don't, that is not, is not financially feasible to upgrade or ensure that it's working. So for example, there may be some steel bridges that is too, is too um, expensive to maintain and to repair. So an example of this is the Spring Bridge in Marianne in Trinidad. We repurposed this bridge as a session footpath and placed a Bailey Bridge next to it for vehicular traffic. So while we didn't completely abandon the structure, um, we repurposed it so that it could have some, some life again. And that's the amendment is a major issue in the Caribbean because we have a lot of coastal roads on it may not be financially feasible to, to do proper protection fits and we may have to move roads inland and therefore abandoning the ones on the coast. So some solutions that we explored, we have, we're looking at providing proper drainage um, using the, well, first of all, using the guidelines and there's a lot of guidelines for resiliency um, that the IRF presented and through PR and FHWA, a um, lot of different guidelines that could be incorporated in, in the Caribbean. So firstly, the most important thing with drainage is provide adequate drainage channels. As I mentioned on, well, for the hillside, for the landslide that occurred on the North Coast, um, once we had, if we had the proper drainage channels, we could have prevented that landslide from being triggered. Um, if water was properly channeled and exited in a safe manner. So that's the provision of adequate channels, especially on cut slopes, or at least on the the hillside or the upslope side of cut slopes uh, along the roadway is a great deterrent to triggering road failure. Well, yes, great deterrent to triggering road failure. We also have to look at erosion and score protection for our channels. So generally for bridge abutments and even the outfalls of box trains and ditches and so, we need to provide that because these are the areas that are most critical for failure. In terms of slope stability, we have to introduce hard and soft measures to ensure that slopes are stable. So soft measures could be land use planning and um, putting in geo or bioengineering as well. Hard measures could be retaining walls, MSC walls, and so these need to be properly analyzed to ensure that the roadway is resilient in terms of being able to withstand earthquakes, um, rainfall events, and the effects of runoff on these. In terms of pavement design, um, the effects of temperature and the, the materials that we're getting in the Caribbean these days, um, or especially the 
materials that may not meet certain specs. We have to look at more mechanistic and empirical design methods to actually model the um, proper materials and know that we can move away from the empirical design methods of the ASHO 1993 um, design method so that we could better understand materials and the response to different stresses. Also, stabilization methods for base course and subgrades and even subbases is important so that we could be sustainable in our design. So we could harden the infrastructure as much as possible and, be and ensure sustainability by reusing um, existing material or improving weaker materials to different um, specs of pavement layers. So some of the projects that I would mention that we're using um, the new or using better, more climate resilient measures is one, one of them is the Valencia Topo Roadway in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, DTTR for short, it's a 43 kilometer roadway and it's going to be an upgrade of the existing Toco Road, Toco Main Road, along with some sections of um, new roadway. It's going through mountainous terrain mostly, but there are some areas of sec there are some areas of the roadway where it's coastal and also passing through floodplains. So some of the things that we're looking at at the in the Valencia Toco Roadway design, it's still in the design process going out to tender soon, but in tender right now going out to construction soon. So we looked at climate change considerations in terms of sea level rise and impacts of intensity, rainfall intensity on drainage. So we so we allowed we looked at the IPCC um, recommendations for climate change in terms of sea level rise and we modified the rainfall intensities by about 10 to 20 percent depending on the locations for and the infrastructure for our drainage. In terms of geotechnical investigations, which was one of the key reasons why the existing Toho Road has generally failed. In terms of lots of, it is loss of land size and embankment failures, whether it's uphill or downhill. So we looked at top, we done a, we did an extensive investigation for embankment stability and scope stability. Um, so the pictures on the right hand side show some typical sections that we have used. Well, top right would have been typical section for embankment stability, showing um, curbing slippers and top embankments and proper outfall ditches, proper outfall drains to ditches at the base of the embankments to capture all runoff. Uh, but that's for embankments and then for your slope stability where you have lots of cuts we did, we did MSAW surveys to actually determine what are the ground properties um, where we are cutting so that we'll understand better whether we need to do slopes at different angles or whether we need to do benching so the picture on the right hand side not an exact correlation to the MSAW survey um, in the middle but it shows that some of the recommendations from these surveys were, done, were used to develop the cross sections. Right. Another project that we did recently was the Western Road Corridor. This was a CDB funded project in Grenada. Uh, this was a rehab of the road from St. George's all the way up to Waltham. It's mountainous terrain, but also some areas of coastal works. So the some aspects of this project has been in has been constructed or in construction right now and that's mostly the modern air land split. So for this project we did a climate vulnerability assessment where we looked at all the aspects, all the climatic effects um, or effects that could um, hamper the road resiliency in terms of um, flooding, um, temperature effects, landslides, um, forest fires, drought, and even man-made effects on the roadway. Um, one of the studies that came out from that was the hydrological analysis of the, of the catchments along the Western Road Corridor. So this map shows you the catchments of all the major rivers through the corridor. Um, we were able to model these rivers and determine from these um, what, are, what are our most at-risk area through flood mapping. So the next slide would show some of the areas that we use, that we, that we developed four flood maps. So based on this, the government has an idea of when, where is flood prone and what needs to be done. Of course, in this project, we also did um, several recommendations as well. And when you look at the area that is heavily blue, as the Bosajo area, um, we were able to, again, we won't, we didn't have general, oh, accurate rainfall records and river state records to validate and calibrate um, the hydrological model, but we were able to develop these scenarios based on actual survey data and flood events that were experienced. So what are some opportunities for growth in the Caribbean? 
So first of all, um, in, as Alex mentioned, I met Alex at the IRF workshop in December last year. And one of the participants was actually developed the Vanuatu, which is a Southeast Pacific country in the, well, Southeast Pacific country, close to Australia, uh, with similar characteristics to the Caribbean. And they were able to develop a road design guide specific to their needs. So they use a lot of codes from Australia, similar like how Caribbean would use codes from America and UK. They were able to adapt those Australian codes and develop their own design manual. So sometimes when you look at the Astro road designs or road guidelines for our roads. So for example, the Topo road and the ODBTT road and the Western road corridor, you can't apply um, those design parameters to these rural mountainous roads. You're gonna end up with massive right-of-way requirements and also a lot of land acquisition, which is not feasible in these in some areas that are very populated. So we need to be able to come together and develop our own Caribbean design manual, manual which takes in consideration our development characteristics and also our topography and, and, other, and other considerations, it's especially with regards to climate change. So we have a consistent argument with regards to climate change or consistent position with regards to climate change in terms of rainfall, um, intensities increases, the design storms where, where or the rainfall events that we're designing for and so. And we also have to look at sharing of sharing of hydrometeorological data so that there's some areas in Caribbean that we can't put a rain gauge in, we can't put a river level gauge in, but based on similar characteristics between islands, we can know that a, a catchment in Grenada may be similar to a catchment in St. Vincent or vice versa or, or whatever, that we can able to that we can be able to share data within the Caribbean and able to develop models to predict um, certain events. All data collection and tracking is is also has room for improvement. Um, again, with the inventories, you need to be able to understand historical context of structures and be able to um, be able to know what is your capacities or what is your what is your at risk in structures in terms of say retaining wall that may be undermining. So you need to be able to track this this data and know um, what is your maintenance schedule as well, especially in terms of road pavement. You need to be able to know this road was paved this so long, um, five years ago. Why is it failing now? And with that information being shared among multilateral agencies, especially within a government, um, is very critical to know your resiliency measures or resiliency capabilities. The case studies, the lessons learned in training, as mentioned, um, what happened to Grenada during Hurricane Ivan and the people who were there, the government agents, the government officials that were there that went through the 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 response and recovery of, of that, for example, um, may not be within the ministries right now. Has the, has the information that they gain or the experience that they gain, uh, have it, has the lessons in, of that been passed on to younger generations and have they been able to train? We have a great discontinuity in training that with our um, older engineers being, um, being um, basically hired on contract periods, extended, extended, while younger engineers are, are being hired, but not in sufficient amounts that they could take over the case, um, the workload from the elders. Um, the Caribbean specific research, we need to be able to develop um, research within our Caribbean, that develop research for our Caribbean needs. So for example, our catchments may not be similar to the, the characteristics of, of those that were developed for the Cupid formula for the rational method, for example. Or do we need to develop a method similar to the rational but modified so that we could consider our topography or topographic conditions. Um, we have some opportunities in the UE that is that is there that is helping to, pr to promote this, but we need to, I think from a government um, standpoint, we need to be able to push this a little more. And whether it's academic or in projects, we need to be able to do this so that we can build up our resiliency measures. And that is it for me. I think I've taken enough time and I'm looking forward to the rest of the presentation and the and your comments. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Kishan. I, uh, I, I appreciate um, the insight that you've brought. Um, and certainly I agree with you that creating regional standards and specifications, uh, you know, is critical for climate resiliency. Um, 
I, I think that that's something that we need to do all too often. We are applying a foreign standard or specification to a localized situation. So we need to localize, um, localize the solution. So uh, I agree with you. And, and the, the mechanism to create that is challenging, especially when we have lack of data, we have lack of capacity. Maybe just one quick question before we move on to our next speaker. You know, you mentioned some of the solutions that you've been provided in the various projects or in, in the design um, elements of the projects. How have you balanced the right solution or the solution you're providing with sort of the perceived increase in cost of that solution to your client? Um, and what, what have you done to, um, you know, let them know that it could be life cycle costs versus upfront costs? Right. So generally, we go to the client first for different projects, and and well, based on the TOR or our understanding, we say that um, if there's a feasibility study involved, we look at the benefit to cost ratio or the, return, or the rate of return investment. Um, we look at we look at that and determine that this infrastructure needs critically um, upgrading or so. So like for the Western Road corridor, we're able to do that. Um, where where you don't have the feasibility of it. Um, we identify structures that are critical for connectivity or flooding or so, and determine that this structure needs, um, let's say, the maximum amount of um, resiliency, and we indicate to the clients like that. So it's a decision from them or the government agency to then propose forward. Right. Thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, I haven't checked the chat box, but if you do have specific questions for Kishan, myself, uh, or any of the other speakers, please uh, do post them in there and we'll try our best to, to answer them. Uh, Kishan, thank you. I would like to move on to our, our next speaker who is uh, hailing from Guyana, just south of where Kishan is at this very moment. I've had the uh, privilege of traveling to Guyana and I'm interested to hear what Shanella Johnson has to say about some of the issues and solutions um, that, uh, that, the, that her country is facing in the Caribbean and her perspective. Um, interestingly, uh, it's a, a very complex uh, geology, especially uh, in the northern part of the country where it's extremely silty materials. Uh, the water table is extremely high and this presents a lot of, um, you know, climate uh, risks and hazards. And I'm very interested to hear about uh, Shanella and uh, the next talk. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Shanella, we, we can't hear you. I don't know if you're on mute. Hi, Shanella, can you hear us? No, we cannot we hear you, Shanella. Apologies, we're just having some technical uh, connection issues uh, with Chanel and Guyana. Um, can you hear me? Ah, yes. yeah, there we go. Perfect. Great. Sorry. I'm no not worries. sure what happened. <laughs> the, floor, the floor is yours. 15 minutes. Thank you. Sure. Apologies for that. So, as, as you're all aware, um, Ghana is often associated with the Caribbean, um, but it lies within South America, the South American continent, and is bounded by Venezuela, Brazil, Suriname, and the Atlantic Ocean. The majority of Guyana's 700,000 plus people live along the country's low coastal plain, which is about 
0.5 to 1 meter below uh, average sea level. Yeah, it typically, typically experiences a, a tropical equatorial climate with seasonal rainfall influenced by seasonal changes, changes of the intertropical convergent zone, high levels of humidity and small temperature variations from an average daily temperature of 26 degrees Celsius or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. There are two typical um, seasons. There are two typical dry and two typical wet seasons annually, with the dry season occurring from February to April and, and July to November, and the wet seasons from April to July and from November to January. Now, in addition to the location, the weather pattern is also affected by El Nino and La, Nino, La Nina southern os oscillations and tropical waves during the hurricane season in the Caribbean. Now, the low-lying coastal region in which the capital is also located is most vulnerable to sea level rises and storm surges. The adverse and potential, potentially catastrophic impacts of climate change are already being experienced throughout Diana again, has experienced significant changes in its climate system since the 1960s. And with marked increases in temperature, sea levels, and frequency and intensities of extreme rainfall events. The Guyanese people, society and economy and environment have been impacted by flooding and drought events. The 2005 flood, as it's commonly called, caused damage estimated at US $465 million, approximately 60% of our GDP at that time. And, and during the drought in April of 2015, portable water had to be trucked into communities in regions one and nine. So you, you can see that there is a, a pie chart that shows the flooding that has occurred uh, versus the droughts and miscellaneous events in 1980s to uh, 2020, with flooding being the majority of the pie. So risk and challenges. Now, Guyana's network totals 3,995 kilometers. It's small in comparison to a lot of other uh, larger countries, but it's still significant for us because that's our major means of econo economic growth and getting produce to varying communities. There are two main routes uh, in Guyana. First, the one is parallel to our Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it's it moves from our border at Suriname and goes to a town called Parika along our Essequibo River. Our second is an inland route that goes through the township of Linden to our border with Brazil. And because of the concentration of the transport infrastructure, Guyana has been described as particularly vulnerable to climate and weather related hazards. So Ghana has been impacted by the following, sea level rises and storm surges, increased air and sea surface temperatures, rainfall and drought variability, extreme rainfall and floods. So flooding has directly impacted our road network. Periods of intense rainfall has resulted in, sorry, in some networks becoming impassable reducing the accessibility to essential services. Some roads within the hinterland network are, are not all weather roads and are prone to instability resulting from heavy rainfall events. Networks that have been subjected to periods of prolonged inundation have seen gradually weakening of the pavement structure. Distresses because of, we see of distresses such as fatigue and the deterioration of the rearing course is evidence, we see formation of potholes thereby increasing the level of maintenance needed and increasing our cost. Our, our network has also been affected by landslides and erosion, as you can see in the images. The one to your bottom left is one of our networks that is within an area that has a cohesionless soil. And after a period of heavy, significant rainfall, we lost an entire the entire embankment with where our culvert was, which resulted in persons who are living in that community not being able to access services and, and be able to come out of that community. The one on the top left is one of our hinterland roads. It becomes impossible after periods of heavy rainfall because they're not all weather roads. And you can see uh, this is one of our urban roads inundated after a period of intense rainfall. 
gaps. So Guyana relies primarily on its sea defenses to keep the Atlantic Ocean at bay. However, despite investment in sea defense maintenance, there are still sections that remain in poor to fair condition. In addition to sea defenses, it's also necessary that training structures are sufficiently maintained. However, much emphasis has been placed on new structures while insufficient financial and technical resources are being applied to existing structures. In addition to sea defenses, road maintenance plays a pivotal role in ensuring the pavement performs optimally. However, plans and maintenance have been haphazard, as such there is need for better routine and periodic maintenance. Although it's envisaged that rehabilitation work will, reduce, will result in higher road levels, there are existing communities where the average ground level is one meter below the existing road elevation, and any increase would significantly impact those properties. Although Ghana has made significant strides in relation to policies, planning, designing and operation and maintenance for the transport sector, we are still weak in the areas of technical expertise. There is no post within our agency or department specifically dedicated to climate resilience or climate change and disaster risk management. Additionally, there is the issue of poor data collection and analysis on the impacts of weather on the infrastructure solutions. So there has been significant improvements to bolster the physical resilience. We understand it will not be a one size fit all approach. So what we have done in some of our networks is to, with where we are doing new roads and bridges and bridge approaches, we have determined that it would be best to have them constructed one meter above the highest flood level. And we've used the 2005 flood as, as a base for that. So all our new projects have been um, constructed to fit that. We have also improved our drainage and drainage, drainage capacity in some areas, not all of the areas. In the areas where we anticipate extreme rainfall, we have implemented retaining structures along, along river banks, and we have extended it on either side for approximately 50 meters to reduce soil creep. New methods of retaining structures have also been implemented. We have used the mechanically stabilized earthen embankment using geosynthetics. That has been used in some of our projects. Given um, designs for, for hinterland roads have changed from, from, from what it was flexible uh, to, in some areas, we've changed that to rigid pavements. We've also evaluated the use of soil stabilization methods. I know Kishan would have me mentioned um, before, but we have used soil stabilization methods, cement. Now we're using lime stabilization in one of our, our projects, and we have used some polymers to stabilize um, our base and sub-base. Additionally, the pavement structure, um, pavement structure design has also adopted the use of clay bonds. So they, they're placed to the the size of the embankment, if you can, you can see in the picture on your right, the bottom right, um, bond being constructed. That helps to prevent infiltration of water from the, the canals on both sides into the pavement structure. As such, um, we've also considered we've seen a, a mass increase in our maintenance. Because if maintenance is actually critical to, and so measures uh, to reinforce our pavement to ensure longevity is something that we need. And so maintenance has been um, improved. Our sea and river defense projects have included road infrastructure protection measures such as upstream uh, river training um, and reforestation. We have also started regular inspections of our culverts and canals. We've removed a sedimentation, control of vegetation, our slopes, we've repaired edges and shoulders and cracks. We also have a monitor and evaluation department and we use our GIS unit to collect the data and to monitor uh, the data and the risk of data that we, we receive. A need for improvement. So although we, our GIS department collects data. 
it's only specific for our sea and river defenses and not for our transportation network. So recently we had a pilot project in which we uh, started to record those roads that are recently being rehabilitated and to have records of them, location, lengths, and so on. And so we're hoping that that will help us to create a database to help us to monitor our road network. We have not done any hazard modeling to determine which infrastructure should be designed for more severe weather events. And so essentially what has happened is that the new structures have all been designed for an extreme weather event, and we haven't considered all the other, any other of the existing structures to be redesigned for that. So there are still barriers related to uh, incorporating resilient design into our new projects, and that's specifically related to access to updated information. We don't necessarily have access to all the um, information available as relates to climate change and natural hazards. And we have had a significant issue in our embankments that are located in areas where cohesionless soil is a naturally occurring material, and we have lost pavement structure as a result of that. And so we are hoping to find long-term solutions to help uh, maintain those infrastructures when, when a hazard or catastrophe, catastrophe hits. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Any questions? Thank you so much, Janelle. Fascinating. Um, yeah, that was my experience when I was in Guyana as well. It's, uh, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of lack of data, um, you know, having to get data yourself or, or use, you know, sources outside of Guyana to, to obtain that data. Um, and I, I'm glad that you recognize that, you know, good data or GIS data is, is a critical uh, roadblock or stumbling block to um, to better understand climate resiliency within Guyana. I was wondering if you could perhaps touch upon quickly um, the rationale behind moving towards rigid pavements. Is, is that because of high water tables? Is that because uh, lack of materials that you would need to import from from other islands or, or through barges uh, from the southern part of the country uh, versus, you know, using flexible pavements and stabilization. If you could comment, I'd appreciate it. Sure. So what we've had, um, as you've seen in one of the, the images that I had, that having a flexible pavement under those conditions in those circumstances, especially in the hinterland regions, have been destroyed as a result of water flooding inundation and so we determined that a uh, rigid pavement would be a better solution its structure is more resilient and so we thought this would be a solution for the hinterland regions where even though it's fund finance intensive it's still a better solution for us we've we have used uh, flexible pavement that have not been able to last the life that we've designed it for. And so we're hoping that this is a better solution in those areas. We've also had other solutions that we've looked at, which includes soil stabilization, but we've not been able to do that on a larger scale. And so this is one of the reasons we've looked at it. Uh, one issue too is the access to material. And so getting an asphalt plant into some of those areas are sometimes difficult. And so it is better for us to uh, transport cement and having aggregates within the area is better for us than having to transport an entire asphalt plant all the way to the hinterland area. And so that is one another reason why we have gone with a rigid pavement instead of a flexible pavement in some of those areas. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, also interesting. I mean, Guyana has the opportunity to use, um, you know, a river system or barge system as a, a key transportation route. Has How has, um, you know, climate change affected those transportation systems, if at so, all? It, it has. Um, we had an issue, I think it was two, two years ago, where we were unable to get aggregates because of um, a high um, barges running aground in some of the areas to, that produce the aggregates. And so we were unable to get aggregates as a result of that. We've lost barges. Um, too and so we've we've had that impact on on our industry as a result yep yeah 
Fascinating. I, uh, I appreciate your perspective and, and joining us today. Um, I know that Guyana has uh, one of the few countries globally that has this uh, great opportunity to develop real sustainable infrastructure through injection of, of oil funding, but as well as uh, a well-educated uh, fraternity of, of, um, of Guyanese globally. So I look forward to seeing how Guyana develops uh, and, and the pavement network develops as uh, Guyana continues to develop economically as well. So thank you for that. Uh, I now invite our third yeah. speaker. Um, so Gordon Keller, a, a mentor of mine and sometimes a colleague, depending on the project, um, is located in Northern California. He's uh, luckily to be on the call today. He just returned from some beautiful time down in, in sunny Mexico. Uh, so Gordon, thank you very much for joining us on the call. Gordon uh, has a tremendous amount of experience uh, in the geotechnical space, the low volume road space, having spent many a year uh, with the US forestry, uh, but now is a private consultant and is extremely generous generous with his, his time, as well as the knowledge that he's uh, accrued over his, uh, over his career. Uh, and I invite Gordon uh, to the session and he will be talking about a lot of uh, climate resilient uh, related measures uh, for roads in, in coastal regions and small island developing states. Uh, Gordon, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. The catch is, can you first hear me and see my screen here? Yes and yes. You might okay. want to make your uh, presentation. Yeah, there you go. If you just no, enlarge okay. your presentation. Okay, that is, are you seeing the side view also? Yeah. So you're on the right track. How's Stay that? Down. Uh, did you hit duplicate slideshow? Yeah. There you go. Yep, we're good. Okay. okay, good. Well, good Good morning or good afternoon. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here involved in this uh, Caribbean climate resiliency efforts here that uh, that IRF and Alex are making here. Um, my, my comments are a little bit more general uh, in the sense that a lot of my experience is in you know upwind topography mountains, but I have spent a, a certain amount of time in training in more in the Western Pacific and South Pacific of uh, Saipan, Guam, Coast Rai, Tonga. But uh, the closest area I've done a lot of work is also in, in Central America, in, including uh, Guiana. Uh, yeah, Guatemala, Honduras. Anyway, uh, so the, the, like I say, my comments are maybe a little bit more more generalized here on, but I think what you see is is similar issues, both what Kishan was talking about and Shanella, um, we're all dealing with many of these very same issues. And that was kind of the, the point of some of my, uh, what, what you see from my, my presentation here. These are just pictures from the South Pacific, from, uh, Puerto Rico, from the Caribbean, from uh, Haiti, um, very similar type of problems for so much dealing with the, both storm, storm surges and drainage and slope instability. Um, what I, and I, these don't have too much to do with Caribbean, but you know, the other the things that we're seeing, this is one from Africa, one from California, same problems. And I think many of the uh, experiences here in the Caribbean would be very similar. The other thing we're seeing in these only two photos I had, um, really showing climate extremes. You know, what we're seeing is one area, one year we can have droughts, and then the next year we can have significant major flooding, and that's what becomes such a challenge for managers to deal with these these extremes. But that's that's what uh, climate the variability is all about, and why resilience is such a, so important, but such a challenge. Um, the, I just want to touch very briefly on, on each of these areas, which I think are, are affected by climate resilience and things that we try and build in resilience with maintenance, uh, surface drainage, the road location, the type of surfacing culverts and bridges, fords, and slope treatments and erosion control. And I'll just touch very briefly on, on each one of those areas. Um, you know, the, the Problem with these uh, small island states is they have a lot of coastal property, and therefore, you know, that's valuable, but it's also vulnerable. And same thing with a lot of the countries in Central America, for instance. And so, uh, you know, and roads ideally shouldn't be built close to the coast; they should be moved further inland. Except everybody likes that coastal view, and so we have times have to raise the road, build seawalls, or do. Um, 
rip rap rapins or rip rap armoring, which <clears throat> some gun times can work in like that lower left photo from Pacific Island. If it's not big enough against the wave action, will move. And so it's it's a challenge to for, to deal with the energy of waves. One of the comments or one of the I think uh, techniques that's being used quite a bit is what falls into the nature based or natural based solutions is be coastal defenses, rebuilding like sand dunes and using natural vegetation to help um, cushion some of the, the energy from uh, wave surge and from hurricanes or, or typhoons. And often I think this needs to be done in conjunction with hard, hard fixes, but it's certainly the probably one of the more cost effective things we can do. This upper right photo here was uh, in Taiwan, where also with coastal surges from uh, storm surges, they put in a lot of these gates on some of their drainage systems so that those surges, it's a one-way gate, so those surges don't move inland. Uh, it stops, the, so the water can still come out from the drainages, but it stops the surges from moving into the, in upland into the country. Maintenance is probably one of the key things, one of the co most cost-effective things we can do is just getting water off the road surface. And, you know, there are a variety of ways of doing that, but a lot of it is just having building in crowns or, you know, surface drainage outsloped and inslope where the water does not stay right on the road surface. These photos are uh, probably very similar to uh, <laughs> others you'd see in just about any country. These are more from Coast Rye and Saipan uh, and Central America. But it's, the challenge is, is if you can't get the road water off the road surface, you're going to have a saturated subgrade, whether it's a paved road or particularly a, an unsurfaced or unpaved road, unsealed road. And so you, you have to have good drainage, uh, cross drains, uh, frequent cross drains, and there's, the road has to be elevated above the, the groundwater or the, above the, the ground level. And so sometimes that takes just raising the grade of the road. A lot of ways we get the water off the road rapidly, and that should be using, um, you know, cross drain structures, rolling dips, uh, rolling grades, uh, things where you're building in good drainage. And, and this is particularly important because there's often there's a lack of road maintenance. I think that's true every place I've ever worked. And so if we just build in features that'll get the water off the road quickly, that's they're the the uh, the most sustaining type of structure. Another aspect of road maintenance, so historically, I think every place I've ever worked, people like to put in, and because they're available, small uh, cross-drain pipes, uh, you know, half, uh, five, 300 to 500 millimeter pipes. And I, I, at this point, I recommend a minimum of probably one meter size pipes, even for cross-drains, because those small pipes just plug up way too easily. <coughs> Particularly, they plug up because of you know, lack of maintenance. One, if, if you're out there cleaning the pipes, they're less likely to plug up, but the combination of both lack of maintenance and the mobilization of a lot of sediment during these storm events um, tends to plug, plug small pipes. So big pipes are better. The differential cost of a one meter pipe versus a half a meter pipe is, is quite nominal. <coughs> Excuse me. I can't handle all this cold weather here getting back from Mexico. <laughs> Um, road location. A lot of times uh, we've put built roads historically in vulnerable locations uh, near streams, near rivers, uh, on floodplains, on terraces. But channel, that's often called a channel migration zone. It's an area where the river wants to move back to at some point. And as we're seeing major storm events, the river does move back there and it takes out the road. So the couple of things we can do. First, move the road if, if you have that choice. You know, just get it to higher ground and further away from the stream. <coughs> Probably a more uh, common treatment is armoring the, the stream bank in some way with rock riprap, with gabions, with uh, root wads, um, some way that you're just protecting the, the, uh, the road embankment against scour and erosion. One of the very common treatments you see in so many, uh, certainly, particularly developing countries, uh, we've used a lot, certainly in the Forest Service and um, you know, in National Forests also, is, is gabions. Um, gabions are fine. They, uh, in the water environment, they do wear out. And like those lower photos there after 20, 15, 20, 25 years because of a corrosion and abrasion, they often very frequently aren't put deep enough. They, um, 
So you get scour underneath them, and once they're scoured out, you lose their foundation and they fail. So I, I tend to prefer rock riprap to uh, gabions, but gabions are making effectively big rocks out of little rocks. So you can use either is available so long as they're properly installed. And again, the best solution is really to move the road if you have that choice. Um, People with several of the presentations already have talked about the, the virtues of road armoring. This is particularly important if you have uh, unsealed roads, you know, dirt roads, uh, unpaved roads. And so they're just very susceptible to erosion and, and to uh, washing, to gully formation. And so I like uh, the, the previous discussion you were just talking about, about the virtue of paved roads. Uh, the Pictures below the on the left was I think from Rota there in the Western Pacific, um, using concrete as a, as one of the best probably best permanent solution. It's expensive, but it's an excellent solution, and real important to have good drainage to go with it. Uh, the lower right photo there was using coral armoring in in Tonga. You know it's a, it's inexpensive as an aggregate, but it also is the only form of or source of aggregate in many uh, Pacific islands. So the pavement's better, but aggregate uh, surfacing is, is very commonly used. Another tra treatment that's uh, been championed, I think, more largely by World Bank is using these um, geo cells filled with concrete as an alternative to making a, a basically a, a concrete road. And so you're taking something that, you know, you've got a, a, a mud puddle or a wet area, you're raising the grade, you're uh, shaping the road surface, and then filling is these geocells that are plastic, you know, maybe um, 15 uh, centimeter diameter cells with concrete in creating a, a paved road, uh, and they, they serve as a form for, for the road. So it's a little less expensive than a, a full structural concrete road. But something that's been used quite a bit in, in different uh, South Pacific uh, islands. This is from the Corobita. Culverts are a huge issue <coughs> because so many islands, there are so many road systems, just have lots of culverts. <laughs> if you ever wondered how many culverts you have on your uh, on your road system, think about it. It's probably thousands. Anyway, you know, the, they're the, therefore they fail often. And some of the things we can do is just increase the, the design frequency of a flow rather than a 25-year event. Look at maybe a, a 50 or 100-year event and size your culvert accordingly. We can rain, if we're using an IDF curves and rational formula or something, a derivation of that, we can increase the rainfall intensity um, in that Vanuatu report, they they, uh, they did some climate studies um, based on you know climate projections. Uh, I think 50 years out or so, which you know is, is during the design life of the structure, and they are seeing some pretty significant increases in rainfall intensity that would, that would have to be used for designing your flows. Two other approaches is to uh, look at a um, bank full width going to a, a wider structure that's more bad banking or matching the uh, channel width of the structure and making sure that you're, if you're going through a normal, say what the Federal Highway uses for a design process, that the headwater height to diameter ratio that you're allowing is probably no more than one. So you don't accumulate debris over your pipe that can help it plug. Uh, three different issues that uh, dealing with culverts that really can help uh, prevent these problems. Stream diversion is when your culvert plugs and the water takes off down the road and washes out the road. So you can put in these uh, overflow dips. It's a, uh, <coughs> it's, it basically amounts to kind of a controlled failure or making sure you're armoring so the water would go and stay in the channel, but in that armored overflow dip once the, even if the culvert does plug. Another thing, the problem with plugging is very common um, where there's a lot of debris, particularly if you've been doing land, land use changes in an area. There's, you know, taking a natural forest and converting it to agriculture, for instance, there's usually a lot of slash if there's been logging in the area. And so uh, that slash can come down and plug up your pipes. And so something we use quite often is these trash racks. It's not as good a solution as a larger culvert, but if you have an existing culvert that's vulnerable and you've seen it almost plug, you can use these trash racks, whether they be like H piles or, or a rack like the bottom photos there made out of uh, it, railroad ties or H, uh, a variety of steel, steel rebar, things like that. Uh, the problem with uh, trash racks is it's one more thing you've got to take care of and maintain. You've got to be able to clean them 
to make sure that they they're they're functioning. The last uh, the other I mentioned was a stream concept, uh, stream simulation. It's something we're using a lot today. Um, if you have a, a small structure in a wide channel, it has a high risk of plugging. One, the flow slows down when it goes into the structure, so you tend to get a buildup aggradation there. They easily plug with debris. So if you're matching the structure to the width of the channel, you have a much higher, lower risk of failure. Uh, it's, so it's excellent from a climate resilience standpoint. And it was really developed more from a wildlife and, and a fisheries standpoint to to give you a natural stream channel bottom in the um, through your culvert, but it's extremely useful from a climate resilience standpoint also. And the photos on the bottom are some examples of, <clears throat> of three different um, stream simulation designs. It's just a, basically a bigger culvert. It does cost more initially, but much lower risk of failure. And you know, remember, we're thinking about something we want to have last and survive for 25, 50, 100 years. Bridges are a huge issue just because they're very expensive. <coughs> the, uh, you know, either obstructions from aggradation or just debris, um, lack of freeboard, uh, scour are all three things that we need to re be concerned about when we're dealing with bridges. Um, these upper cut photos were actually from New Zealand, a coastal area where the debris you can see in the superstructure there is because it had a lack of freeboard. So they were actually physically raising the, the uh, deck of the superstructure of the bridge to uh, gain more freeboard. So that's a capacity issue. Scour is a big issue. Uh, most bridges actually fail because of scour. So you want to make sure you have good protection around your abutments have your foundations deep enough. And that's something that should be built into the, the design of the structure. But you can add rock riprap or, or gabions or concrete, things to protect against scour. And one of the best things on, on the short span, you know, small structures is just not like this middle photo here, not putting in a mid-channel pier or structure, because that's what tends to catch debris. That's what tends to accelerate uh, scour. I, I really like low water crossings. They're limited to more, you know, low volume roads, but the uh, advantages of them, you can plug a big diameter pipe like this one on the left here on the top, of, uh, that's a three meter pipe. And then we put in a vented Ford. And so the debris basically goes over the top of the Ford. A couple of the, I think, key issues that need to be uh, considered in Fords is often you see them built in with a number of small pipes, those small pipes plug. And so then for they, they don't serve as a vented Ford. Also, because you're accelerating the flow coming across that slab, um, often you'll get scour at the outlet edge. This is a picture that I think was in Saipan, um, but I've seen the same thing in many other countries. Um, and you need some sort of protection on that downstream edge of the Ford, uh, either a cutoff wall, or a splash apron, something to protect against that increased velocity. Slopes, a lot of different issues with slopes. Uh, I think we already saw some good examples. Sean showed some great photos here. Um, here is just a variety of different issues dealing with slopes. And, and you know, we have we have a lot of different treatments we can we can use. Uh, the more simple ones are, are using deep rooted vegetation to take care of shallow instability problems. We get to the re retaining structures and anchors and things in buttresses when we have a deeper seated um, failures and, and the challenge there is to find uh, the type of structures that are the least expensive that will do the job and today your mechanically stabilized earth MSC structures are the ones that are most commonly used and then deep patch is just something that's a uh, heavy maintenance and if you're having a and this is something we can do more as a preventative rather than a, a repair structure which is putting in if we have a, a slope that's starting to settle like the photo on the bottom left um, you can put in several layers of geogrid or geotextile and actually a, a, a reinforcement. So it's, it's the putting in, putting in actually making a reinforced fill, but only partially reinforced in the top two or three meters. And so you're taking something that's marginally unstable and making it marginally stable. <clears throat> Some of the better treatments, uh, particularly for shallow slides, is, is biotechnical treatments, whether they be, uh, you know, vegetated structures, whether it be uh, brush layering, uh, live stakes, or here in the bottom, this VRSS, it's vegetated reinforced soil structures. It's, it's a combination of a reinforced soil structure 
mixed with vegetation. So you get the benefit of the, in the aesthetics of the vegetation, but you've got the geogrid in there for, for structural support. Erosion is huge on the many Pacific islands. I, I should have included a picture of Guiana as some of the most erosive soil I've ever seen, but these photos are from oh, Guam and Tonga, um, the other Pacific islands where you have these deeply weathered soils that are extremely erosive. I think Yana is because it's so uh, sugar, you know, like sugar, fine sand, is it's so highly erosive. But the two key things with erosion is control of water, which comes back to surface drainage, and ground cover, just getting getting a type of ground cover, often netting initially to help seed germination and pr uh, protect the seeds. But what we really want is vegetation in the long run. So it's something you really want to put some attention to detail into. Uh, finally, here three documents. Uh, I think uh, Kishan mentioned this Vanuatu road design guide uh, with increasing road resilience for as a, you know, as a, a small island state. <clears throat> this recap structure or uh, document here in the middle is was uh, developed in South Africa, but is, has a lot of great road uh, resilience measures. And this storm damage risk reduction guide that I was involved with on the right here is deals again with a lot of practices born in a, in a mountain environment. So these three documents, I think, have some of the best, most practical, um, you know, just vulnerability reduction measures that can be implemented, but particularly dealing with uh, some of your lower volume roads. So with that, I'll um, just want to make some, some general you know, comments that, you know, maintenance, lack of maintenance, that's, I think uh, both Chanel and Kishan mentioned, you know, it's it's something I think we've seen every place in the world, that there's a lack of maintenance. And so, you know, you, your ditches get plugged, the uh, culverts get plugged, the road surfaces doesn't properly shed water. So maintenance is probably the most cost effective thing we can do to keep the roads in good shape and minimize damage from a major flood. The other issue with a vulnerability assessment, uh, you know, we've got a we don't have enough money to do our job, so we have to prioritize what are the highest risk sites. So we go through a vulnerability assessment process and decide that the you know the highest risk sites or the sites that are going to have the highest impact um, are the sites we have to put our money into and try and uh, stormproof as best we can. And a lot of the <laughs> the rest of our road system we we deal with uh, you know when we have to, but we can't fix it all, so we do that uh, prioritization through vulnerability assessment. So with that, I'll. Um, I'll quit my presentation here and uh, say thank you and go back to sharing the screen with uh, with you folks. Thank you very much, Gordon. Uh, I'm always amazed, uh, you know, if you've never seen a, a Gordon Keller presentation before, the uh, pictures he's been able to amass over uh, his working career are, are fantastic. Uh, Gordon, just one quick question before we open up to some um, general questions as well as wrap up the session. And I still appreciate everybody who's still with us uh, today and who's, um, you know, spent the last uh, hour or so with us. It's uh, appreciated. And uh, I look forward to spending uh, further sessions with uh, a greater Caribbean, um, more Caribbean stakeholders. Um, but you've been involved with, you know, writing or or amending guides and standards. And I know that there's a lack of capacity that came across in each presentation today. It's always right. about capacity. Right? <laughs> how, how complicated or what is the process involved to uh, localize uh, like a foreign guide or standard <laughs> to, you know, local context? Well, I, I, you know, like I think uh, Kishan mentioned, so many of the standards are based on ashto you know high really high standard roads and so so you and, and there's a lot of low, low volume road or low standard uh, road design guides out there so it's a question of going through them I, I was recently doing that for actually a project in Cambodia and you know it's it's looking at where you can uh, make sure you're not building in small design a small structure or small culverts for instance is making sure you're um, recommending probably larger open box type structures uh, rec always just increasing the frequency of maintenance particularly after storms looking at uh, the type of soils and if they have maybe a two to one slopes recommended if it's really clay soil perhaps recommending three to one slopes um, 
yeah and and then running that back by local people who have that local experience and seeing does that make sense to them based on what they've seen you know in their own areas so it's uh you know it, it can be done and then getting people to finance and and buy into that <laughs> is isn't a, a second large challenge but but if you you know really look at you know as engineers we look at life cycle costs but you know just the simple part if you build a paved road or you build a you know build a bridge it's designed for you know 25 years 100 years and you can ask people well do you want it to last that long or not and so it's you know and, and like you i think you mentioned you know you, you should maybe maybe build uh, 20 kilometers of road well rather than 25 kilometers of road poorly and so it's you're kind of appealing to people's better judgment on on that and dealing with better newer specifications Great. Yeah, I agree. Thank, thank you very much for that insight. Um, I'd like, I'd like to move uh, to opening up to the floor. Firstly, I would like to thank all of our speakers today, uh, Chanel, Kishan, Gordon. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, Majid and the IRF as well as uh, anyway for donating the, the time and resources to, to put this session together. Uh, this is just the beginning. This is the second session that we've had and we're looking forward to you know, growing it uh, to to um, you know to introduce more speakers and uh, have the Greater Caribbean region, you know, collaborate together. Uh, I would ask that if there are speakers, uh, sorry, if there are participants online today who are looking for either specific information or topics, that you reach out either to Majid or myself, and we will do our best to address those. And if anybody out there is uh, bursting with the um, enthusiasm to give a presentation. We are always looking for unique uh, presenters and would uh, definitely try our best to have you on the next panel session in about uh, four months or three months from now. Uh, last thing before I hand it over to Majid, and if, he, if there are any questions, he can, uh, he can table those. But I really would encourage this uh, network that we're starting to grow to participate in the upcoming IRF Caribbean Congress in Puerto Rico at the end of uh, July. I found them to be extremely beneficial. The individuals that you're able to meet there and talk about um, like, like problems and like solutions um, is really valuable. So I would encourage all of you, if you can, to participate in, in, that, uh, in that Congress. Uh, so Majid, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you to all our presenters, and uh, definitely a uh, big thanks to Anyway for, like you said, donating their time and support to uh, to help uh, get get this community of practice uh, started. So again, as Alex said, you know, the floor is open for questions, so we would like you to uh, uh, to address any questions to me or Alex or any of our, our, our participants. We actually have a, a hand up here from Dr. Benjamin Colucci from, uh, from Puerto Rico. Uh, Dr. Colucci, I will unmute you. And uh, feel free to, to give your comments. Dr. Colucci? Yes. Yes. Um, thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, excellent presentations. Um, Alex, uh, excellent moderator. Uh, the, just two comments. Um, in terms of the publications that uh, Gordon mentioned, uh, to address the these issues in the Caribbean, should we move more to guidelines rather than manual or codes applying engineering judgments uh, taking care of the regional uh, best practices is that the way to move alex or any of the pa panelists you want to gordon would you like to uh, would you like to address that well i yeah sure i'd be glad to mention that um i i think you know, whether it's uh, guidelines or whether you call it a you know a design manual, uh, I, I tend to I'm not sure what exactly the difference is between the two of them. Uh, it's certainly I think it would certainly be highly desirable to to get something that's very uh, Caribbean centric, you know, based on just with the experiences from the just the Caribbean islands. But but there also is a pretty wide range of, you know, everything from tropical to just almost uh, semi-desert conditions in the in the in the Caribbean islands. And so, you know, it, it, it could be a pretty comprehensive document that probably wouldn't end up 
in terms of actual practices looking so different than than some of the other guidelines that are available out there today but you could certainly focus on a lot more uh, more of the um, the weather uh, expectations and uh, you know site specific information and some of the uh, soil types that are encountered in in those islands and how that affects your climate resilient solutions but doing something but having coming up with something that's i think people feel is 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 their own product there in the caribbean would would be highly desirable so thank you dr kushi thank you what i wanted to um, clarify if, if i may to all the speakers is that uh, due to the uncertainties associated with uh, uh, climate change uh but understanding the knowledge of of the of, of the soils the the, the weather uh, the, the hurricanes, everything that we have in the Caribbean. To, it is my opinion that we should move more to guidelines that the engineering judgment of those experts in that area, as well as those from other countries, the engineering judgment gives you more space to make decisions rather to be tied with the manual. Because if you move to manual code, you're very restricted. Therefore, guidelines needs a, a lot of experience of the experts and allows the the, the 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 variability of understanding your soils, your traffic, your climate. That was the point I wanted to make. Thank you very much. Excellent presentations. I, I think you're right that oh I'm sorry that yeah guidelines do give that flexibility if if you know manual can go either way, but if you put it into specifications, you're telling people specifically how to do it. So yeah, that's what you're I think suggesting to move away from. Kashin, did you have some thoughts on that? Yeah. So, for example, in that Kashin. Kunina Western Road corridor project that we did, we designed the road to 30 kph design guidelines, even though the road is actually a 50 kph road. But again, if you're designing for 50 kph guidelines, you're looking at massive horizontal and vertical alignment improvements, um, right of requirements, last position. It's gonna. It would have been a massive undertaking. So, while while we understood. 50 kph was the posted speed limit for the Grenadian government. We couldn't have done that. And we had to go, go more with a guideline of 30 kph to suit the topographical conditions. So yeah, so I agree with that, that yes, it should be guidelines and not really codes if we're adapting um, the American or international codes for our situations. You, you know, but yeah. all the presentations, Kishan, Chiyan, they mentioned the lack of data. When you have lack of data, your experience over the years on other projects at the national or international level makes you to make those judgments if it does a low severity or moderate or high severity, understanding the balance between going to detailed process versus getting all that uh, experience that you have had to make that judgment. That That's the reason that it is a balance of interest of how how much data you have, how um, how accurate is that data, so you can use sound engineering calls based on your overall experience addressing those uh, critical issues associated with the, uh, the climate and uh, climate change and, and resiliency, etc. Thank you again. Thank you for your time. Excellent presentation. Looking forward to meeting all of you in Puerto Rico. Yes, no, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Colucci. And th thanks thanks there for your input and as well as well as the panelists. Um, so I'll give Connie here maybe just a minute here to see if you have any more questions, but I don't think uh, we do. Again, if you have a question, you can put in the chat box, you can put in the question period, or you can just simply raise your hand and uh, we'll, we'll do our best uh, uh, to address it. While we're waiting there for questions, um, I do have a, I mean, I think the question has been addressed before, but uh, the, this particularly goes for maybe Chanela and, 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 and Keyshawn and also Alex actually, is like, you know, the resilience, planning and building for resilience is obviously gonna cost a lot more money uh, than it would be to, just to, you know, build a road the way you've, you've always done it. And kind of what, what kind of have been effective strategies that you guys used to convince the authorities and the politicians like, Yes, it'll cost more, but it will save money in the long run. So, has you know, do you have any successful examples, or have, you know, of, of how 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 you've convert you've, you've convinced your your decision makers to, to make that extra investment? 
Yeah, I'll, I can touch on that one, uh, Majid. It's, it is, uh, it's complex and it depends from region to region. Um, I'm of the opinion that a climate resilient solution doesn't always have to cost more. Uh, if we're localizing the solution, uh, often that solution can be the same um, cost as, you know, what, what had been designed or what, what intervention had been recommended, um, which I think is one of the critical reasons why it's so important to understand local context and local capacity so that you can introduce interventions or solutions that are fit for purpose. So they're not always more expensive. In cases where they are more expensive, it's providing your client or the road authority with the typical graphical tools. You know, I think pictures um, can say uh, more than a thousand words that Kishan was good in providing some flood modeling data, we do a lot of that ourselves, providing the, the client with a visual assessment of this is this is what is going to happen based on conservative estimates of either rainfall or whatever it may be, so that the, you know, the, the decision maker, the politician can actually visually see it because they may not be an engineer, right? But if they're provided with the the correct information presented the right way, then they can make a you know a better decision about whether that that investment is required or not. Okay. Well, no. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Keishan, did you have something you want to add? Or no, I agree with Alex on that. That most of the time, decision makers are not technical persons. At least the ones who are ultimately making the final decision. So we have the technical people in the ministries and government other government agencies that would back us up on providing more resilient infrastructure needing the required funding and so but usually with politicians it usually comes down to dollars and cents and if they could split money on different projects instead of spending um, a lot of money on one project then they might prefer to do that but again we just have to uh, ourselves as technical people we have to present facts and figures and say that this is your this is a requirement to meet um, infrastructural changes or resiliency um, in the future because it, it looks basically it comes down to looking embarrassing for a government to build new infrastructure and have it fail in a short period of time. So you have to balance that. Okay, well, no, th thank you, Kishan, and I fully agree with you there. Okay, I think we have one question. I think we'll, we'll answer that one last question and then we'll give it back to Alex to kind of summarize what we, um, what we learned today and to uh, to send us off. So the, this last question we're gonna address here, it, uh, it's from Michael uh, Maluki and he's asking, how can we incorporate the local communities into these resilient solutions? And actually that fits in a discussion I was having earlier with Gordon as he's actually in the middle of rewriting his uh, low volume roads engineering guide. So um, I don't know who, who wants to address this question, but the uh, floor is yours uh, to the panelists. I can answer that. So one of the um, so one of the premises, one of the premises of this um, conference that Majid had sent was what what um, whether we have issues with local buying. And most of the time, there's not an issue with local buying because people want to see better roads, want to see um, better drainage solutions, want to make sure that they, there's no landslides and so. So in terms of that, the local buying is usually not an issue. From, for getting to improve in infrastructure. And, and in fact, it, again, in terms of politicians and communities, um, these works, especially if you hand it out to smaller contractors, community-based contractors, it provides op employment opportunities for the rural communities or, or local communities. So generally, people like to see that, that you can give employment in the communities. And again, it's improving their infrastructure. So they're, they're happy with it. I mean, there may be some instances where a large contractors come into smaller communities and there's, there's always issues with getting jobs and so but again people generally want to see want to do the work and want to see better better conditions or infrastructure conditions for themselves okay. yeah uh, thank you thank you Majid. i just my my first about three different ways you kind of deal with that is one in you know working with an interdisciplinary team one so you get you know a little broader perspective just from the technical standpoint second i think is in part of the it, you know any big project if you're doing any type of environmental analysis you you should in be, in, be incorporating you know the public in getting comments uh, having you know public meetings talking about what the what the project is and what you're hoping to achieve 
And then things like having community-based maintenance, you know, those that just directly plugs the people in the communities right into the project. And they can quickly tell you where all the problems are <laughs> and what are the most vulnerable locations. So each of those is a ways to, to help, um, you know, get, get a broader perspective and, and public input into projects. Okay, well, th thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Um, any other comments from the panelists on this question? Um, I don't think I see any. So uh, again, uh, just on behalf of the IRF, I'd like to thank uh, thank all our panelists. Uh, most of all, I'd like to thank uh, the participants. And of course, again, Anyway Solutions uh, for being our partner on this um, Climate Resilience Roundtable series. So stay tuned. Uh, we try to have these uh, once a quarter. So we will, uh, we'll be announcing a date shortly. And of course, we, we look forward to seeing everyone in, in beautiful Puerto Rico, in, in San Juan there. Um, from July 30th to August 2nd, uh, where we'll, you know, we'll really address some of these issues in details. We'll have some workshops, and it won't just be resilience. We'll discuss road safety, uh, traffic management, etc. So again, thank you, everyone, and look forward uh, to to seeing everyone again soon. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mateo. Well, have, have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank you.